This is the I Read Comic Books Podcast. I am your host, Mike Rappin. With me this week are two just real good friends of mine, Kara Shimborski. Hey. And Brian Murray. Hi. Thank you both for joining me this week. I'm really excited to talk about what we're doing today. But before we get into it, I have two small announcements. One, if you're a Patreon backer, you'd already know this, but... We have a Discord now for I Read Comic Books. So if you're a Patreon backer, you get access to this cool Discord, and you can talk with us whenever you want all the time about comics. There's a whole room dedicated to X-Trash. We were talking about this X-Wing board game that Brian is apparently super into. Man, that's um, bad. That's a problem. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> it's really great to talk to people. So if you're not on that, you should totally do it. You can back us at any tier, and you get access to that. Uh, also, Paul and I recorded the first episode of a new series coming to our Patreon exclusively at the end of March, I think, maybe early April, all about the Doom Patrol comic series by Grant Morrison. So if you're watching the Doom Patrol TV show that just started and you want to know about the comics, you can listen to that show. I think we're going to have seven or eight episodes, and we're going to talk a little bit about the TV show at the end, too. So get on that. Anyways... Let's talk about what we're actually here to talk about this week, which is comic books. So I'm going to ask the question I ask every single week. How have you been? How have comic books been? Let's start with you, Kara. Well, like, I've been great because I've been in Bali all week. <laughs> okay, so I, I saw that on the internet and I was like, oh no, she's supposed to be on the show this week. Is she going to be broadcasting from Bali? No. Also, where is Bali? That was the other question <laughs> that I had. Well... To answer your second question, Mike, you're an adult who has access to Google, so I'm kind of disappointed in you. <laughs> um, Bali is an island that is part of Indonesia, which is like okay. north, n- like north-ish of Australia, but like just south of the equator. Right. And um, so I went on my magical tropical vacation to celebrate my birthday because it was a big birthday so i wanted to do something big for it and that was Woo! going to bali and uh it was it was great um if you've seen or read the book eat pray love which i i didn't but this was most people's point of reference julia roberts in the film goes on this magical like spiritual adventure where she's just like I'm going to reset myself as a person. And so one of her stops is like hanging out in Bali and getting like spiritually healed. So I did all Mm -hmm. that. I got cleansed in these like holy waters that are supposed to wash your past soul clean from any like karmic imbalances. Whoa. Right. That's cool. It it was pretty rad. (laughs) And uh, I saw um, it's called like a spirit healer. And it's like they read your energy and like real like apparently my heart chakra was really messed up so they like clean that out (laughs) okay um, so when the folks of i read comic books suddenly disappear and become superheroes we're gonna know it's because kara started this a la captain america style marvel 1602 thing where you appeared with superpowers and then the rest of us get powers i'm really excited yeah we got this and and it was great it was it was so wonderful it's like the tropical climate the the dollar goes super far there so i Mm -hmm. I got to be a rich person for the week with not rich people money because like the average salary translated in like if you have a good salary in bali it's the equivalent of 500 us dollars a month so holy smokes yeah so i felt very wealthy over there (laughs) and um but it was great and then i crashed a bicycle into the canal of a rice paddy and my face got beat up oh no (laughs) so uh i'm real glad that i'm able to podcast today because even yesterday moving my mouth was difficult (laughs) because i had like flat uh, like i thought my teeth had broken and like thank god they aren't but like yeah i mean you can't you you came away from it i mean quote unquote unscathed as relatively in like no broken unscathed. bones yeah 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 nothing broke my teeth didn't shatter it felt like it for a second and i was like Ooh. no <laughs> like i'm fine it's all superficial it's just like up till yesterday it hurt to smile because part of the injury was my mouth <laughs> so right um, and that's your favorite thing to do is talk like- <laughs> i love being on this podcast so i was like i i was like i'm landing i get an attempt at a full night's sleep and then i can wake up and read the comic and be on the show i could do this and then after this crash i was like oh god can i do this will i suffer through this like i do when i'm sick like anyway 
So Well, you know what? Everyone's sending you good vibes. <laughs> if you're you. listening to this episode, send some good vibes to Kara. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, oh, great. I, I obviously did not have time to read comics because I was too busy uh, making making rings out of silver and looking at dolphins at sunrise and things like that. Right. So <laughs> forgive That's me. That's okay. <laughs> That's, you know what? Get your get your chakras all set up. Get all that cleanse. Get take care of yourself. That's that's good. That's Thank totally you. okay. Thank you, Mike. You lived a comic book. I think yeah. is what happened. You didn't <laughs> it read really one. Really feels like that. Oh man, when the <laughs> when the um, what is it's not the TSA agent. Who's the guy that checks your passports when you come back into the country? The he like looked at agent? customs yeah. agent. Yeah, he looked at my face and he was just like, "Where were you?" I'm like Bali. He's like, "Did you get jumped over there?" I'm like. No, I had a um I crashed a bike into a canal in a rice paddy and he just kind of like looked at me with this incredulous look and started laughing and he was like you what? And I'm like like he's like you where? I'm like in a rice paddy. He was like what? I'm like they grow rice in Bali and I was biking and I'm not an experienced biker and it had been raining and this was a very very narrow concrete track that I was supposed to be balancing on and I lost control of the bike and then I went into the canal and he was like you know what? That's a great story. Go with that. Hidden into the country you go. You don't need a customs form. <laughs> Goodbye. And I was like, well, Welcome back to the U.S. <laughs> so, so Kara got jumped by Sir Isaac Newton. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to tell that to the kids at school tomorrow. I was I was traveling with a coworker who's a teacher, and I was like, hey, ethically, what are the grounds of me lying to the children? Because I, like, I let the kids out of their cars every morning. That's part of my, like, one of my job duties. And I'm like, mm-hmm. what if I tell every single kid who asks me about my face a different story? Like, am I allowed to do that? Can I just get wilder and wilder with each tale and find out what comes back to me via weirded out parents? But one of them knows the truth. That's got to be the, exactly. the whole crux of it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my plan for tomorrow. Gotcha. Cool. Well, <laughs> since you live the comic book, we'll move on. Brian, how have you been? How have comic books been? Can you top that story? <laughs> <laughs> no, and I'm not even going to try. Sorry, like, Brian. Uh, no, it's fine. I don't want my life to be that exciting. <laughs> I uh, I stayed around the house. I, I watched a lot of TV. I watched all of the uh, the Titans show from oh, uh, boy. the DC thing. How was that? Is it just grimdark? I got the it's, grimdark vibe, and I decided not to go into that. It's kind of it's kind of grimdark. It's kind of like Robin can say fuck now, like. <laughs> Is that the selling point, Brian? Uh, pretty much. Uh, it's it's fun. It's kind. Of, it's not very good. I would say, like, if you're somebody who has no fondness for these characters and who doesn't like this kind of TV show, I would not recommend jumping into it. But if you've been enjoying a lot of like the the CW TV shows and want that, but they swear more, then I would say the Titans is a great show for you. Gotcha. That's certainly how I approached it. I'm so torn, Brian, because your pitch for it appeals to me because I do enjoy the CW's ridiculousness. But mm-hmm. I ha- I just I just you all know how I feel about the Teen Titans. I don't know if I could watch something subpar with them in it. Right. I, I don't know if I could do that to myself. Yeah, they're not real sure what Raven's powers are yet. She's her her powers and her backstory are kind of the focal point of at least this first season. And so there's a point where, like, I think she destroyed all of a guy's organs at one what? point. Mm-hmm. What? Oh, yeah. Everybody kills everybody. Like, what? Starfire incinerates, like, five Russian mobsters in the first episode. Oh. Oh, man. Well, and, I uh, mean, I can, yeah, I can see that. Okay. You get a real close-up shot of Robin throwing one of his stupid R-shaped, like, throwing stars. Oh, he directly. has those? Yeah. <laughs> He throws one directly into a guy's eyeball Ooh. and like just stabs a guy in the leg at one point. <laughs> oh my God. Can we talk about those R-shaped things though for a second? Because like the Batarang, I understand. It's basically boomerang shaped already with like a few yeah. little details. Mm-hmm. It's aerodynamic. This is a proven design over centuries. How's that R going to go through the air? Like, I feel like this is a very challenging like target practice thing. Like that shape is just not meant to fly straight. You know it's got to pull to one direction or the other. Oh, yeah. I want someone to get in on this and g- give us a physics explanation about how this works or doesn't work. Yeah. Please. Sign up on Patreon, then hop on Discord and give us the rundown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice plug, Brian. Thank you. I thought it was very smooth. 
Yeah. Com- comics wise, I did do a little bit of reading this morning. Uh, I read Die Number Two, which is nice. You know, everybody's everybody's a big fan. We all know why that book is great. Um, this book had a lot of really interesting back matter about why Gillen and Company chose to pair a given die with a given archetype. Yes. So we're looking at like this is why the fighter type class goes off of the eight sided die, which as a massive D and D nerd, I was fascinated by. Hmm. Uh, I mean, the book also just continues to be excellent. You know, Stephanie Hans is <laughs> incredible. Mm-hmm. And the story is only getting more interesting. Brian, if I don't know anything about tabletop gaming, because I'm sorry, everybody, but it bores me to tears, will I mm-hmm. still enjoy this book? I think so, yeah. I think that you won't enjoy it in the same way that I do, but I think that there is still a worthwhile story being told. Yeah, I think if you enjoy the way that Kieran Gillen kind of takes apart his characters and then kind of rebuilds them with his stories, you'll enjoy this book. Like, I, I feel like I've, I connect really, really well with Dai, not in the same way that I think a lot of people connect with Wicked and, Wicked and Divine, but I still think he's telling a story about some very, very interesting characters. It just happens to take place in this, like, you know, tabletop RPG style world, but he's still doing kind of the same characterization and, you know, broken backstories, all the kind of things that he's done in other books. Um, not to, like, generalize his books, because they are very different, but I think if you like the way he tells stories, I think you'll enjoy Die. No, I, I, th- I think Kill Your Darlings is a fairly accurate assessment of Kieran Gillen's work. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, no. Not I've... to jump on Brian for that, <laughs> no, but I mean, no, that's, that's... I feel very strongly about this book. <laughs> I appreciate the support. All right. How about you, Mike? Uh, for me, I actually have been reading a lot. I, I keep finding myself opening the Shonen Jump app just when I've got like a free 10 minutes and like just eating one chapter of a, of a manga at a time. And it's actually been super helpful in getting me through some stuff that I've been putting off reading for a while because I'm like, oh, there's so many chapters. But take it piece by piece, it actually, you start to get through 30, 40, 50 chapters over a couple of weeks. It, it feels like I'm actually making progress. So I've been reading Claymore, which is um, a book that I've been reading for a little while, so I don't want to talk too much about it. Um, and I also, you know, read the newest X-Men books. Won't talk about that. But <laughs> the thing that I do want to talk about is Wasted Space numbers one through seven. And yes, number seven's not out yet because Michael Morici, he sent me a copy of number seven because I was talking about it online. So Raggedy Joe, who is constantly just giving me shit on the internet, which I'm fine with, challenged me and said, hey, man, I can't believe you haven't read Wasted Space. You're talking about it on the show because I mentioned it last week but I hadn't read it. So I was like, screw it. I bought all of it, and I read it all in a sitting, and oh my god, what the fuck was I doing not buying that book? Um, This is uh, Michael Marici. This is Hayden Sherman on art. Colors by Jason Wordy. Holy cow. What a beautiful, well-structured book. Um, Joe on Twitter, he was telling me about this, and I, I was kind of hesitant to jump in vault has like a price point that I'm like, oh boy, that's a lot to invest in for six or seven issues. And turns out it totally paid off like this is a really fun sci-fi book it's got a very grim and gritty feel similar to Morchi's uh roach limit that he did over at image a little while ago which is like a series of three mini series um but this one has a lot more heart i think there's a lot more fun that he's having with it i think um the writing feels very much like take the action-packed sci-fi weirdness of fifth element and put it into a much bigger more understandable universe and you get what this book is like on a very very high level i felt like every time the book was going to go too cynical or too grim they would kick in some lightheartedness that felt natural in the story it wasn't like just to try to lift spirits it actually really really works based on the characters in the story um sherman's art is fantastic and i was really worried about it which is kind of one of the reasons i was hesitant about this book because i was worried that like these flat black lines that he draws it seems like everything's drawn in the same kind of pen I thought it was going to bother me, like it was going to like be an eyesore. I was going to notice all the harsh lines. But actually, I really, really liked the style. I grew to love it over the multiple issues. And it really, really well like added a, a distinctness to the story that made it feel like it was a standout story. It kind of reminds me of the way that Tommy Lee Edwards do, does art. And I don't know if you guys have read any books by him. But he has this very just almost scribbly, heavy black ink style that makes him stand out compared to a lot of other uh, excuse me compared to a lot of other 
artists out there. And I think Sherman's art in this book is the same kind of way. I wouldn't say they're the same styles, but they their inking patterns are very similar, which makes them very, very distinct. Um, I could keep saying that word over and over, but um, Wordy's colors are something that I was really blown away by. It took me a couple of issues to actually notice that the guy wasn't actually painting or using whatever digital art to um, create like solid colors on everything, like a character's skin tone or their clothes or the background it doesn't just have like one or two colors. It looks like a wash of like four or five very similar colors. So even from panel to panel, you'll notice that characters like move from the background to the foreground. They're the same exact color, but the wash on them is different. It's really, really hard for me to describe. But I think if you just look at some of the preview art for this book, you'll notice that everything has this dynamic feel to it. And it it works really, really well. And now that I've read uh, subsequent issues, like issue number seven has this amazing just orange page that like really blew me away. And I noticed that they kept cutting around like the camera angles of the book. And you would notice that that kind of wash in the background was never the same in two panels. And I really, really appreciate that. Like the dynamic color in this book. Um, It's all like the same color of orange, but it's washed in a different way. I, I can't, again, can't describe it. You got to go look at the preview for this. Um, I'm really impressed by this book. I'll just say that. Um, So yeah, I got issue number seven. I read it this afternoon before we started the show And man, this book is good. I'm really liking where the next arc is going for this story. I was kind of worried that this was going to be like a one and done six issue thing. But with the establishment of the end of issue five, I should say, which is the end of the first arc, which is all in volume one, and then reading six and seven like in a row, there's a much bigger story that I think is at play. I wonder how far Marici is actually going to go with this series, but I could see it running for like 30, 40, 50 issues, kind of on the same, like three characters running around the universe trying to stop catastrophes and ultimately try to kill God. That's kind of the... (laughs) Dramatic. um, Semi-spoiler story that's going on here. Um, But yeah, there's a lot of really interesting villains. Um, I liked a lot of the twists in the first arc. Man, I, I'm just blown away. This book totally kicks ass. Like I said last week, critical acclaim. People love this book. I am now one of those people that loves this book. So that's the book that I that I read. I I just wanted to make sure that Joe got what he what he asked for. I, say, I read Joe, your fucking book, Mike's dude. Ass for a Jeez. <laughs> my, my, I'm going to find something and I'm going to challenge you as well, Joe, to read something. So just wait. It's coming. But Wasted Space, I'm subscribed. I'm pulling it. This is a book I'm totally into now. Mike. So this was the jet lag talking, but I did read a comic that, if I may, I would like to talk about super, super briefly. Yeah, go for it. I forgot because um, it's sixteen hour. It's fifteen hours in the in the future in my body right now. <laughs> yes, because yes. time differences. Anyway, um, so I talked about being excited to reread this book in the summer, but I don't think I actually talked about it. But I wanted to talk about it now because traveling always just kind of like makes me traveling internationally especially makes me just feel kind of uh recentered in terms of my perspective because i remember that i and the rest of america are not the center of the universe um mm-hmm. and so i revisited dennis the menace in california <laughs> which is oh, a, nice. a faucet comic from 1965 nice. that i went out of my way to track down online and get when i was moving out here um because I remembered reading it when I was a kid because my grandmother had saved a copy. And so it's... So for those of you who are not familiar with Dennis the Menace or are only familiar from the 90s movie, um, Dennis the Menace was a super popular non-superhero comic character in the 1960s. And he was just like a rambunctious little boy who always got into trouble and was annoying everybody. But he's just being a kid. He's like a spiritual predecessor to Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes with much less right. philosophy. Right, right. So, <laughs> it's just all antics with Dennis the Menace, right? Right. So this was interesting for me to revisit because this is like a look at road trip culture in America in the 60s. Because you have to remember like 50s and 60s people were really getting cars 60s the motels were springing up on the side of the highway air travel was still not affordable for most people so the road trip was how most people spent their vacations and saw Mm -hmm. more of the country so that was like a new thing in the 20th century like roadster tourism 
So yeah. this this comic is essentially like a road trip through this area of California. And so it goes like Yosemite, like Tahoe, San Francisco. And it's basically like telling kids about these places through the medium of a Dennis the Menace comic. And so like having just traveled and now coming back to this new relatively new place that I live, it was nice to kind of revisit that through the context of a comic but mm-hmm, and also mm-hmm. like noticing little things like it's it's the mid 60s so um i forget when was jfk elected i don't remember uh, but 64 right so Six, something like that right so his <laughs> inauguration he didn't wear a hat and that's what caused men to stop wearing hats and uh. so in this comic most of the men are not wearing hats, but some are. And I love that detail because it's just probably such an accurate reflection of that time with like the times were changing in terms of men's fashion, but mm-hmm. a lot, but maybe some of the older men weren't letting go of their hats so easy. And so like that was an interesting moment for me. And also, oh my goodness, so much subtle racism. My goodness. There's, oh really? Yeah, there's like um in in the Yosemite section or like the fort um there's like they visit a f- a fort and there's a prison and there's like the dummy of a Native American like chained up in the prison and like oh. they painted him red <laughs> and I was like oh Yikes. and like they visit <laughs> Chinatown in San Francisco and like the one line of dialogue for a Chinese American character is him talking about chop suey He's saying something like chop chop makes chop suey and they painted him yellow and I'm like oh no mm. oh no <laughs> gotcha I think you I think you mentioned this book on a previous episode of the show before too not like to this in this detail but I think I, you I mentioned said, like, like trying to find it yeah I was like I'm hyped for this book I need to get a hold of it and this is my I had just gone on a trip. I'm like, oh, I'm back in California. Now that I'm like back in California with fresh eyes, let me revisit this Dennis the Menace book. And I'm just like, Mm -hmm. man. And also like now that I work with children every day and Dennis says like, I'm four going on five. And I'm like, you are a super articulate four year old. (laughs) Like, Who who gave you these lines? Like I like there are super articulate four year olds who are almost five who can talk almost like him. But he just makes them very clever clever jokes and aside scenes like climbing on top of like railings and like running away from his parents and i'm like "Ooh, did the person who wrote this have children because <laughs> this seems like a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah oh well cool i mean let's i i i do want to talk about dennis the menace more however we do need to move on we can do a mini i will say <laughs> comic books are coming out on february 27 2019 let's talk about what we're excited for this week brian let's start with you uh, this week, I'm looking forward to Buffy number two. Uh, that's the Jordi Belair, Dan Mora book that just started coming out uh, this past mm-hmm. month. Uh, I was always a huge fan of the Buffy series. Um, that I discovered it on whatever channel was showing the reruns in like 2005. And just kind of fell in love with that world. And it's really interesting to see how this reboot, or so to speak is taking shape because they're doing a really good job of capturing the spirit of the original show Mm -hmm. but they're definitely not trying to do like a beat by beat rehash of what happened before you know like it because sometimes if somebody does like a a modern reboot or something it just kind of feels like the same story only now they have smartphones whereas this (laughs) actually they're they're taking creative liberty with the story while keeping everything feeling like Buffy, which I think gotcha. is probably a, a pretty hard line to walk, but they're doing a great job so far. Cool. Cool. I uh, I think I'm going to check this out in trade because I, I also enjoy Buffy, but I never got into like the season eight, nine, ten, Angel, Spike, everything else um, <laughs> that existed. But, you know, fresh starts with new Buffy. I mean, I'm willing to try that. I read big chunks of that when I first discovered uh, Hoopla. Because Hoopla mm-hmm. had a bunch of them. I don't know if they still do or not. Because I think that, kind of like Netflix, I think that what's available on Hoopla changes over time. But, right, right. But yeah, there was a solid week when I was unemployed where all I did was read Buffy comics. <laughs> Thank you, public library system. Thank you, unemployment. 
<laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, Kara, what about you? What are you excited for this week? Princeless. Find yourself number five. This is the arc finale for book seven. Uh, Princeless is a series that I really enjoy and uh, I usually trade weight on. So this is more of like a, oh, this is the last issue of this arc. That means the trade is coming. So I'm pumped for that. Um, Pr- Princeless, I is an all ages series that I I super enjoy. Um, The concept is there's this girl who's a princess and she has, I think six sisters and like all of them are supposed to be like married off. It's the whole like princess trope thing. And like, they're all in their own like separate prisons. Like one of them's in a tower. One of them's guarded by a dragon, like that whole trope. Oh, and okay. so this print, this one princess decides, you know what, this is garbage. I'm going to save myself. And so she rescues herself and goes around like rescuing her sisters and they have adventures and it is super fun. And I, uh, I especially adore it because um, a few years ago when I was uh, co-hosting the Comicsologist podcast, they, mm-hmm. we uh, interviewed the creator, Jeremy Whitley at a comic convention and got to talk to him about what inspired him to create this series and it's a pretty simple but powerful inspiration he was like my daughter is a girl of color and the i want i I am disappointed that there aren't that many like role models for her in media so i decided to make one and i was like bless you (laughs) so that's cool i mean if it's going on for seven books i mean obviously some people are reading it Oh yeah, it's like it's it's super cute. There's like uh, I forget what arc it's in, but like there's this whole issue that's just devoted to the girls talking about their hair. And mm-hmm. hair is a really important part of um like like hair is something that is from my my understanding is like super important in terms of uh representation in media Mm -hmm. because not all hair is created the same and most hair that we see in western media is hair like mine which is of european descent and blonde and like you can run a brush through it but not everyone has this hair and they have this whole issue just talking about these girls of color and their hair and the things that they have to do to kind of wrangle it the way that they want to and i thought that was a super interesting choice to include in this like adventure book but it didn't feel like a this is a very special issue it was like part of the story it made sense but i was like this Mm -hmm. is you included this this is awesome so that's fantastic yeah i I, I I super recommend princeless i can't believe i haven't heard of this this sounds fantastic i i might have to find this at the library yes yes, it's definitely been on my on my to read list for a long time Okay. Oh yeah. Def- I, yeah. I just was looking at some of the art from the preview for this issue, and it looked gorgeous too. Oh yeah, it's it's super fun. They've uh, I think they've cycled through a few artists for the different arcs, so it's nice that you get like slightly different art styles, um, especially for the different adventures. And there's like, oh, there's this whole pirate arc. Oh my god, you guys should start reading. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I mean, yeah. cool. I so- will. I'll add it to my list. Yeah. Uh, for me this week, uh, I'm, I was going to say Wasted Space number seven, but I feel like that's cheating. Uh, so I will just, I'll play the old standard and I will pick Age of X-Men, The Extremist number one. Yes, another X-Men book. I've heard that this book is also called Horny Cops. Um, yeah, so the story is about uh, Psylocke, Iceman, Northstar, Blob, Jubilee, and Mineta. They protect people from threats they don't even know exist yet, including the most insidious threat of all, love. So these cops are tracking down love, but if you look at the cover and if you look at Blob as a character in this whole Age of X-Men universe, he's very much holding on to the, I'm just going to say daddy vibe, like he's got a big old thick mustache and he wears a big huge coat and he's got a ton of chest hair and he's a big huge guy, like that's a thing, you know? I remember saying something on Twitter about how Blob fucks now, so. Yeah, that's definitely a thing. Um, it, it is bizarre. I, I say horny cops because a lot of the people I follow on Twitter, specifically the Battle of the Atom guys, that's what they call this book. Like they made a wonderful Photoshop of this 
cover for number one, and instead of it saying extremists, it says horny cops, and it is fantastic. Uh, <laughs> I'm excited about this. It's just another Age of X-Men book. Leah Williams is on writing uh, Jorge's Yanti. I don't, I don't know. George's Yanti. Maybe that's how you say it. I don't know how to say people's names. Uh, is on art. This book just looks good. It's another tie into the Age of X-Men, and I'm all in on this event. So... Yeah, but horny cops is definitely the thing I'm looking forward to because they prevent people from falling in love. It's a whole thing in the Age of X-Men universe. I, I will do a whole expose on this one day. This sounds wild, <laughs> Don't you Mike. Well, Age of X-Men is weird because all mutants are born from eggs. That is like a key point of the story. Mike. And so you can't have a relationship with anybody because you may produce children the old way. <laughs> and that's, yeah, that's a thing. So, <laughs> horny cops. <laughs> I, I want you to do it. it, it what is this, Age of X-Men? I need you to do, like, a mini-series about this, Mike, where you just break down the episodes and you're like, this is crazy because everything uh-huh. that happened. <laughs> I mean, I'd I'd be happy to do an Age of X-Men expose when this is all oh, done. God. Do it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You're welcome for that one, folks. <laughs> it's going to be a mini-series of Mike and one guest, but it's just Mike talking and the guest going, what the fuck? Over and over again. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm really I... excited for that on Patreon, Brian. <laughs> Me and you. <laughs> I think I missed the egg part when the first time you were talking about this, Mike. You were like, yeah, they're all born out of eggs. And you said it super casually. And I'm like, wait, 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 what? Yeah, yeah. D- that's... Yep, that's Age of X-Men, all right. The kind of Incredible. confidence that had me going, wait, is that how it works for a second? <laughs> like, Because I went to public school, man. I don't... <laughs> I've got a mental picture now of like a, an ostrich egg. And all of a sudden, you see like little scratches forming, and all of a sudden, mm-hmm. like this tiny miniature Wolverine bursts through, and like he's born with that hair. Yeah, yeah like he's born fully <laughs> smaller version of but himself. A foot tall. <laughs> it's just yes. like a tiny Wolverine slicing through, and he goes, <laughs> "Snicked, Bob." There's a, <laughs> like that. <laughs> This week on I Read Comic Books, we are talking about the Goodreads Book of the Month from Under Mountains. This is by Marion Churchland and Claire Gibson with art by Sloan Long. And this book was picked by all of our fantastic people over at the Goodreads group. Thank you guys. Thank you all for voting. We get tons of votes and tons of people commenting on things. It's really, really cool. It's such a fantastic group over there. So let's talk about this book. This is a book we were focusing on this month's theme was a creative team that was all women and so or at least majority women writer and artist and um so we this book was nominated along with a bunch of other ones so brian Kara, what did you guys think of from under mountains i think like this has been on a like a list of books that i've been meaning to read for a long time and now i had a reason to actually read it other than just trying to get through my backlog so i want to hear what you guys think before i jump in any further you know those the like archival sized hardcover comics where it's like this is the size that it was drawn in this is like a 16 by whatever format Mm -hmm. i want to read this book in that format because these colors and panel layouts were so cool and i was reading it on my phone and i'm like this is useless what am i doing i need to see like poster size prints of these pages so that was that was my first impression because i really liked how they how they used uh the sequence of panels to show motion there is this one sequence where there's this one character who's at the top of a cliff and it's three in a row and the char- you see the character like slowly receding away from the cliff but at the same time you're seeing this from the angle of like the base of the cliff so that character is super tiny and then there's like nothing in the first panel and in the second and third panels you see that there's another of the characters kind of like just passing below and it was super cinematic and i really love that choice when i was just looking at it it was like damn it why am i reading this on my phone i need this full-sized right yeah this is- yeah i mean i want to say before we get into this because this is something we always forget to do full spoilers for from under mountain so if you haven't read the series get on that then come back and listen to this episode <laughs> okay. sorry before we get too deep into it that's all go ahead Brian. that's fine i was gonna say there was another uh there was another page like what Kara's talking about later in the book when there's uh I think it was later, it might have actually been earlier. I don't 
remember what order things happened in this book. Time is a construct, Brian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair. And this was a flashback anyways, so. Uh, where the the lord in the current timeline of the book is hunting. And there's this really cool page where one of the characters is shooting down a bird. And you kind of, like, track the bird as it falls out of the sky. Which is, of course, you know, tragic because, I don't know, I like animals. <laughs> Leave <Aww>. me alone. <laughs> yeah. but, also, yeah. but also just, like, very cool how they showed it moving downwards in one page without it being distinct panels right 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 yeah this there there was a lot of really cool moments where they they would do motion like that i think it's it's weird because i felt like the the art in the book was kind of a, all over the place where some pages were just mind-blowingly cool and other pages i felt like there was just like some rush behind them um I mean, that being said, I, I, I enjoyed the book, but I, I feel like we should at least maybe give a little synopsis about what From Under Mountains is and maybe get some character names out there, right? Like, the the official synopsis of this book is Old Blood Feuds Rise Up From the Past to Haunt the Ruling Family of Cars Gate Keep. Young Lady Elena must defy convention and assume her father's role, facing forces that threaten Akara from outside its borders and, worse yet, from within. So there's a lot of, like, political intrigue in an old royal family thing that goes on with this story, which I think is what draws a lot of people to this book, because I feel like a lot of people want to read fantasy books, and yet sometimes you get books like this that seem to have longer stories, and then they fall flat because the numbers weren't there or something. But um, the art in this book really should be the selling point in a lot of cases, I think. Oh, it's so gorgeous. Well, my super lazy comparison, kind of building off what you said, is that this is like a super low-key Game of Thrones. Because, okay, for me personally, when I'm watching Game of Thrones, I know maybe three character names, four character names. I'm just mm -hmm. watching and I'm like, that dude! And that guy! And I kind of remember what you're here for. But for me, it's more like I'm watching it and it's an experience. And I'm like sort of following what's going along. But mostly I'm just kind of like, all right, that thing. From like two seasons ago cool you brought that back and i'm getting a similar vibe from from under mountains because there's like like the the main plot thread is the synopsis that mike just said but the the meat of the story is like okay well these people clearly have their own agenda and these counselors clearly have their own agenda and oh look there's a mysterious knight who has like kind of being shady about why he's so renowned and there's like this witch woman and her apprentice and you don't really know what's going on there and there's this thief and i just feel like there's all these characters and i have no idea who what anyone's name is and some of the people i'm confusing for each other like all those old gray dudes in game of thrones there's like four like dudes who are assistants to people and i'm like you're all interchangeable <laughs> i don't yeah. i don't know yeah. what's happening so for me this is like Let's take Game of Thrones, but, like, everyone's a person of color, and there's less, like, we're going to, like, murder everyone, and a little bit more, like, mystery and intrigue, which I like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely good to point out that there were, like, this was a, a high fantasy story that's not set in medieval Europe analog, which right. I think is amazing and would love to see more of, um, because, you know, you, you look at... Your, your Lord of the Rings and whatnot. It's all still, you know, pale skinned people in big stone castles living over top of like green grasslands and rolling hills and stuff like that. But in this case, we have this, this multi-ethnic cast of characters set in what looks like a, a, a keep high in the mountains. And there's sort of like a, what I interpret it as being sort of like a swampy marshland nearby where the the witch and her apprentice lived i could have been hmm. misinterpreting what that whole area was, was supposed to be but that's kind of what i got was kind of like brambles and swampland and stuff yeah yeah i mean it's it's there i don't think that there's necessarily like an analog directly to the type of land they lived in but it felt like yeah there was there was definitely some distinct like up on mountains into <laughs> I mean, given the title of the book, From Under Mountains, which, which I realize is a reference to the whole mythology of the story, which I wanted to see unfolded, but unfortunately, it looks like this book was kind of cut short, and we didn't get to see the rest of it, but um, 
Yeah, they're, they're, the environments in this world are, are really interesting because it seemed like there was a lot of browns and reds and oranges when they were near the castle or around it. And then when you got out into the forest, there was a lot of blues and greens, which kind of natural, but definitely trying to remind you that these are two distinct areas. And I feel like there might have been another layer of like meta- metaphor on top of that to say like there was this cool, lush area versus this high, dry, very high tension area. Um but uh, the, with the with the dark blues and the greens and stuff, you also got this mysterious darkness that was paired along with it, which we we saw a little bit unfold when we saw this monster come out, um, and we we actually went and met the witch who lived out in the in the forest and stuff. Um, I, and I think that there's a lot to be said about what they did with color too. But you know, I could I could go on and on. I'm totally detracting from Brian's point here at this point. No, you're reinforcing. No, the the shadow monster thing. Uh, was like kind of a key part of this book and I didn't totally understand what was happening the whole time that it was there but I liked that sort of by the end where you get a confrontation between the witch and the lord you're like oh so that for me was (laughs) very satisfying because the whole time I'm like what's with this smoky monster thing and then when the witch like eventually explains this is all of the the badness that has been building up in me and I needed to expel it or else I would turn into something like even more horrible. And Mm -hmm. I just thought that was so cool because I feel like in a lot of books, even fantasy books, magic is used, but they never really do anything like, like if the, there are consequences, it's like you've sold your soul to the devil or something like that. But it, this was just such a unique take on what happens when your magic changes or if right you're, because like you're changed right and i feel like that's an idea it's like if you have magic it's like surprise you have magic or like maybe you have magic and you're learning how to use it and it's not very often that you see magic discussed in terms of it being something that's changing something that you can affect something that might be affecting you how it's affecting you and i loved that in this book and Mm -hmm. the manifestation of the shadow monster and what that meant to this woman's magic and how she felt like she had to um end things i was like i hate it and i love it and it makes sense and i want more fantasy like this please yeah yeah i i I loved the confrontation between the lord and the witch where they're oh man yeah they're talking to each other and uh, we already hit the full spoiler warning he killed her daughter a long, long time ago, and so she killed his son with this smoke monster, or mm-hmm. she manifested the smoke monster, and then it killed his son. Uh, I'm not clear how much control she really exerts over it, or if it's just kind of yeah. like following her intentions or her desires. Either way, they have their conversation about, you know, she asks him if he thinks the scales are balanced now. And he says that there are no scales. That and I, I just love that as I don't want to call it a moral because that sounds way too simplistic, but I love that they're embracing that idea of like when someone goes through something as tra- traumatic as the loss of a child, there's no making it up to them. Like nothing will ever yeah. make that go away or make that better. And so you can understand like this is why she's lashing out even though she doesn't expect killing the king's son to make anything better it's just what has to happen because of the way grief has changed her and like kara was saying shaped her magic the part that i liked the most about that confrontation is more towards the end where it's like after them saying like oh is this balancing the scales no it's not balancing the scales and it's like right before It's like the Lord has accepted that he's going to die and they're both going to die. And this is what's best for everyone. And like right before she obliterates the both of them and presumably this smoke monster, she whispers in his ear, you have a daughter. And the implication there is you asshole, because he has been like totally ignoring his daughter and just like he's like clearly written her off ages ago as just a political pawn to use in an advantageous marriage and the whole story so far you've just seen her like these extra panels not e- not even extra panels like they 
it's like they seem extra but they're not extra where they're just looking at her looking downcast all these times that he ignores her or like doesn't want her to go travel or like doesn't feel like she needs to study more like her brother does and so for me that was the witch being like hey like also kind of fuck you for treating your daughter like shit and like and it was like that little like last knife twist to me that she reminds him like actually you're like you do kind of have something to live for so you're kind of being a selfish asshole by being like everything's the end because my son is dead yeah that's so interesting because i read that totally differently i read that as being much more of like an ominous statement saying that you know like this isn't over yet you have a daughter oh whoa oh man i didn't even look at it that way because i I definitely read it the same way as Kara, where it was like, you act like this is the end of the world, and you could have been, like, cultivating, like, working with your daughter to prep her to become the next leader of the land, regardless of your son. But, oh, man, that, I mean, unfortunately, I don't know if we'll ever know, but, like, that would be an interesting way to take the story, I think. If if it were to continue, at least. So then it's like, if the shadow monster is not actually dissipated, then the shadow monster will probably be stalking the daughter. And if the shadow monster did dissipate, maybe the apprentice knows something. But the apprentice earlier said that she didn't want to turn out like the witch. So yeah, I, yeah. I want to read more. <laughs> intentionally <laughs> no, not asking any next? questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I and like that was kind of one of my my feedback notes that I had on this. It felt like there were a lot of loose ends. Like the book, the story comes to a conclusion, at least in the arc of the you know the Lord and the witch and the, and his son and Elena. She decides that she's going to go travel and and things like that. But it never like again, what happens to Elena? What happens to these un- from under mountains? What happened to the roguish character that kind of was in the middle of this and never really got? enough story like i know she had a moment at the beginning where she was talking to people but it seemed like she was kind of just a delivery device to get the sword from a to b and continue this other storyline that was happening but it seemed like that wasn't the end of her story there was more to explore there and again there was a ton of other things they could have explored like this whole from under mountains thing as an idea of this you know great deity slaying all these old gods or monsters or whatever and the mountains grew on top of them like what a cool idea like, does that mean that there is some inherent magic in these mountains? Does that mean that these beasts could be reawakened? Does that mean that this deity could come back? Like, so many things that I wanted to at least read a little bit more about. And unfortunately, we're not going to get that. But I think that's like, it's it's the weird thing where like, this book came out in 2015. And I don't think in 2015, we were ready for a lot of like, independent fantasy the way that I think we are now as like a comic reading culture where books like Sleepless do okay like Sleepless ended after 12 issues which is kind of unfortunate but I think it at least was able to tell a solid story for 12 issues but I think we're seeing more and more fantasy stuff kind of start to come up and if this book had been published a few years later um, maybe it would have survived I mean I didn't buy this book when it came out and I feel like ashamed because this is totally a book that is my shit and I would be super into, but I I remember seeing it thinking that it was about something completely different. I thought it was about, like, an alternate history in the United States for some reason. I, I don't know why, but that's what that's what my mind was drawn to when I whenever I saw the covers for this. Um, so I'm, I'm really kind of bummed that this is the, like, last we'll see of From Under Mountains, but who knows? No. Yeah, I thought at the don't end d- of the trade it said that, like, it will be returning, but that could be... Yeah. Maybe they thought but it was going to, and it never did. I don't know. Yeah, I want more. I need to see these goblins that everyone keeps talking about. I know! There's, there's <laughs> that was the thing. The one panel where they show people talking to the goblins, and you can't see their features or anything, but they're tall? Yeah. And having, having you know grown up on D&D, like, the idea of tall goblins is so interesting to me. Yeah, it's almost terrifying. Um. <laughs> well, did you read in the trade, there's... a uh, there was like very brief back matter where it was talking about the mountain pass and also some of the gods. Uh, no, I saw it was there, but I was reading it at like one o'clock in the afternoon before we recorded. So I didn't really stop. So, so in the, there's like a one or two page back matter piece that's like talking about the history of the mountain pass. So basically Mm -hmm. it sounds like the land that this keep is located in, and like the the ruling land kind of adjacent to it were separated by 300 years 
because there was like this mountain pass that the goblins had made, but it was sealed off. But it points out that the mountain pass is made in a different architecture than the goblins typically use. So no one's like quite sure where this pass came from. Only that interesting. Yeah. Only that like these two opposing armies started like funneling through it. And like, I, it's the past that was referenced in terms of this like knight who's dragged out of the gutter to come back and do a mission. Mm-hmm. And so it's like this same past and the armies go through it. And this, this back matter piece was talking about how the goblins just watched and they didn't get involved on either side. So that to me was kind of hinting at kind of what you were saying earlier about like these old gods are dead or the, under the mountain or are they dead? Like if this pass was created not by the goblins, could it have been created by these gods? Are there other forces happening here? What hmm. is the deal with the goblins? What's their part in this? We're about we were like as this book was ending, uh, our heroine was about to meet with the goblins because they trust her family line. And I'm like, show me the goblins. What's the deal with the past? <laughs> Where are these freaking goblins? What is their deal? Yeah, what do I, they I, know? Show Again, me there the was, goblins. There, there, there was a lot of lore in this book that was like, you know, goblins only trust long family lines. And I'm like, what, what, what does that mean? How did they know? Like, <laughs> I mean, it's it was it was very interesting to see, like, the little like breadcrumbs that they were trying to settle or, or spread throughout this book to say like look at how much extra world there is for us to build off of and i i really appreciate them trying to establish like a very solid world i think i think between the three of us it sounds like we wanted a lot of lot more story in this world just to hear about the fantasy that was created like i think churchill and gibson did like a great job establishing that i just you know unfortunately the book fell flat yeah, but yeah i mean it's, it's um, definitely some of some of the best world building that i've seen in a long time yeah uh, i as much as i want answers to all these questions i also really like and appreciate that they didn't try to explain everything it's because yeah. like i don't need them to it always throws me off when you see you know character a explaining something to character b for two pages that character b should already understand just from living <laughs> right, in this right. world like i i appreciate that they didn't take us out of the story to explain things but i also oh, yeah. desperately want things to be explained <laughs> i'm a complicated <laughs> I, man <laughs> yeah i'm a big fan of show don't tell and trusting your reader so I definitely yeah. appreciated that this was just kind of like some of the things in this book didn't make sense just because we didn't understand the rules of this world yet. And I love that. Like I got some hints from the back matter. I got some hints from dialogue of what was happening. And it was just like when when world building is this subtle and thorough, I really feel like it doesn't matter if I don't understand because I understand that there are rules that these characters are following, mm-hmm. and I don't need to understand them. I just need to know that there's consistency in what's affecting them and why. Yeah, and I mean, things like that can always be fleshed out, you know, in subsequent volumes, subsequent stories, back matter. I mean, and it doesn't necessarily all need to be laid out. I think to Brian's point, like, there there are books that do that, but they do it in the right way, and it can work. But I feel like in this story given how many plot like threads there were kind of going on it would have been like a detraction from the rest of the story like it would have been really out of place for them to be like don't you know regulus don't you remember how the world works when blah 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 and then they flash back for three pages <laughs> yeah, you know and there's already um, a million characters so there's no room for yeah. like an audience surrogate or anything like that well yeah and that that was something that i think a lot of the people in the goodreads group brought up like they felt like there were too many characters that some people looked kind of samey and um i i can see it to a certain extent i mean francis for example uh he he had a positive thing to say about the book he said you know my opinion on this book is that it's great and in a similar way to the a previous book of the month nimona it manages to exist in a fantasy environment which borders onto reality close enough to allow me to enjoy it um but unfortunately i think a lot of people in the goodreads group were very middling or worse on the book and there was a lot of call outs for art but i i don't know i there were pages like i said that i felt like things felt rushed but um on the whole i i enjoyed the like the fantasy side of books of the of the book like 
that they established. I think there was a lot to work with, um, and it was very rich, like from beginning to end. I never felt like there were things that were drawn out. Like some folks ca- called out something that I think Kara was mentioning about this idea of motion over multiple panels, um, and they were like, "Well, they just repeated the same thing." But I'm like. But it shows time passing. Like, I've read books where they do a time skip, or not a time skip, but like a a change of scenery between panels on the same page, and I feel like it's really jarring for me as a reader. And I appreciate them taking the time to draw these things out to show, like, this character traveled very far, otherwise we wouldn't have been spending time on that. Um, I realize I just jumped into a whole other thing because it's been, like, in the middle of my head since we started talking, and I'm just like... I understand that there you can ha- I I've read comics where they repeat panels and they do things like that but this book it never felt like there was any wasted panels like it didn't feel like they were just trying to stretch things out or maybe fill in fill time or do something draw something easy it was everything felt intentional um and I I appreciate them actually trying to establish that things take time or they don't take tam- time by showing multiple panels of things or less panels depending yeah i think that intention was definitely the right word to use like everything that was put into this book was put in there for a reason Mm -hmm. the only downside is that i at least was unable to figure out what that reason was in some cases gotcha gotcha oh yeah i'm not trying to call anybody out and say they're wrong but like my interpretation of it was slow down a bit take a breather but maybe that's just that's just me yeah i I think that it it kind of goes back to what we always say where not every book is for everyone and people Mm -hmm. have different preferences and some of those preferences might be about pacing so the pacing in this book was very languid and i can see that that wouldn't appeal to everyone Uh, i do agree with the comments that some of the characters look kind of the same like a lot of the dudes as far as I was concerned, were totally interchangeable. And for a while, I thought the witch's apprentice yeah. <laughs> was the daughter. So that was confusing uh, to me. Okay. But um, but I think those are such minor things that didn't affect my overall appreciation for this story and the art. And uh, like I said, I see why people would find the pacing like too slow or like annoying especially since there's so many things that we wanted to see more of from this book but i personally liked that because it felt more like um it, like it, it is kind of a, a journey book and mm-hmm. like we're we're talking about lord of the rings like lord of the rings the like the whole first book is just them walking for like the entire book so like you have to figure if that was a comic if that had started out as a comic it would literally have just been panels of the characters walking and right. so like that also took forever like yes yeah, stuff happened but in between that there was just a lot of walking so i like right. when stories like this do acknowledge that not everything's happening instantly it does take time to go from a to b and even even like small moments where that that knight who's like pulled off the street is like cutting off his hair and washing his face. It was so great that those were separate panels that were included to show the transition of him from like vagabond to back to kind of looking like a put together person. Because if they hadn't done that, I would have been like, wait, is that the same guy? And it was just so much more effective Mm -hmm. than having someone say, Oh, you cut your hair. Oh, you clean up well. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. There's something to be said, though, I think, about how successful fantasy comics are. And I think that the problem that maybe some people have, maybe they didn't, but this is something just my own observing of, you know, reading a bunch of comics and enjoying fantasy, like the fantasy genre, is that if there isn't a lot of humor, I think folks kind of trail off. Like, there's only so much serious fantasy that people can put up with. I think you look at something like Rat Queens, which is on the same level of wackiness in fantasy world that uh, this book is. But I think the difference is, one, it's very, like, over the top in some cases. There's a ton of humor. They do a ton of swearing in the book. Um, And and not to say that those things are bad. I I love Rat Queens. I still read it. But um, it's a different kind of fantasy. And I think something like this or something like a Sleepless, um, those books are very, like, on the on the whole, very serious. The books are just a drama that takes place in a fantasy setting. And those books, I think, are a lot harder for people to get into because it requires you to 
just read a drama. Not everyone is into that. You know, most people are reading comics for some comedic value in some cases or action packed or something. And the drama that you get out of them are like, is really, really high stakes. Um, and I'm making a weird broad generalization about people reading comics. I don't know why, but what I'm saying is like a lot of the times fantasy comics, if you want to tell like a serious story, it's a really hard sell to people. Um, and it can rub people the wrong way because there's just not a lot happening when like character development and stuff like that. Like you were just talking about multiple panels of this guy getting changed from one person to another, um, or basically fixing his look can take time. And it's like, you're supposed to be taking the time with the character in their transformation. Um, and there's no like joke that punchlines the entire thing. Um, whereas in like a, in like a rat queen, so I'm just going to keep coming back to that one, or maybe like a D and D comic, there will be some kind of joke um, because those types of things they they like add to like the the beat of the story like the pulse of the story is like having a joke every once in a while to kind of keep you invested and give you a different feeling from the comic um, whereas this one um, from under mountains is very much just like a serious tone throughout and you kind of have to um, lean in on just the suspense and drama of the story when there's nothing to to really um make you feel anything different throughout yeah it it definitely feels like we use fantasy as a term for a genre but it seems like we're getting to a point where we need to start specifying what kind of fantasy because oh sure as you pointed out this is a fantasy drama like it's a fantasy political thriller almost Mm -hmm. whereas rat queens is a political or a political a fantasy comedy and a D comic is an action fantasy mm-hmm. and it's one of those things where we just kind of recommend hey if you like fantasy comics you might like this but right right you know, the person who loves the D D comics might not love this book right and i mean that doesn't mean this book is bland and has no humor in it I mean, i'm i'm kind of talking about the book on the whole because there are there are moments but on the whole it, it is more of a drama well, than it is a comedy the, the, the point of this book is not to be funny whereas with rat queens yes. the point is to be funny right so yeah let me get off my soapbox um <laughs> fantasy comics are good and you should read all of them and appreciate all of them the end um or else Mike. period <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I knew you felt strongly about this, but I didn't realize you were like bordering on X Men level, feeling strongly no, no, about no. this. No, no, no. I'm, I'm kidding. I just, I, I, I think the more I think about it, the, <clears throat> the more I'm, I'm bummed that there isn't more of this book, um, because I really did enjoy it. Like on the whole, I, I appreciated the story. Um, despite some of the issues I may have had with the art, I don't think that it detracted from the, like you said, the overall story itself was still very solid. Um, so at this point I'm repeating myself over and over. So final thoughts about this book? What do you guys think like about From Under Mountains? Are there other books like this that you enjoy that you could recommend to people since there isn't more of this series? Uh, maybe a a wittier, maybe not a a wittier cop version. (laughs) uh would be the spire i would i would recommend the spire if you liked the fantasy world building vibe of this and the political intrigue uh the spire is very much uh more of a like a a, more dialogue more police trying to figure out weird stuff happening going on so there's just like more action and more movement but in terms of like place in the middle of the desert and maybe there are mountains nearby and there's like this whole intricate space going on i would recommend the spire um final thoughts for this book hashtag show me the goblins (laughs) (laughs) what about you brian um i don't know i thought it was i thought it was fine yeah I, i would like to see more just because i'm invested in the world now but eh. I don't know if I I don't know if I'd drop money on it. <laughs> gotcha. Definitely a good library gotcha. read for me. Okay. How about you, Mike? Any books you'd recommend? No, I've got nothing for that. I tried to think okay, of one that's... and I got nothing. That's all right. That's all right. Um Yeah, I, I enjoyed this book. I think um I, I would probably put it at the same level as Brian. This is like a get it as a trade, maybe rent it from the library kind of story. I mean, at this point, you know, we we always want to encourage folks to buy books and, you know, 
spend your money, you know, put your money where your mouth is and kind of things. But um, there, there are a lot of fantasy books out there that work really well. I think Sleepless is a book that I will champion until the day that I die, um, just because I love that book from beginning to end. It's a very solid fantasy story. There are... I would say, compared to this one, there aren't as many, like, gender role issues that are, like, kind of a focus of the story. It is included, but it's not the, like, one of the primary um, issues in the story. The More of the story is the mystery, and there's some suspense, and um, kind of character betrayals, and character um, unbetrayals. I don't know what the opposite of that is. But, uh, yeah, I think Sleepless is a good one. Overall, this is a solid book. I'm kind of bummed I put it off for so long. Because, like I said, really enjoy fantasy books. So if you're looking for just a solid fantasy drama, that's what we'll call it. From Undermounted is a seriously good read. So, you know. But yeah, let's wrap up the show, I guess. Um, You can follow us all on Twitter. You can follow Kara at KaraSZam. You can follow Brian at BrianHead. You can follow me at Mike Rappin. And you can follow the show at IRCB Podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram if you aren't already. I try to post pretty often on there. We also have our Goodreads group where we post weekly discussion threads, vote on book of the month, things like that. Uh, This week's thread is going to be on comic book nostalgia. You can find us on the internet at ircbpodcast.com, where we have a pronunciation guide and a merchandise store where you can pick up a copy of our zine. Please rate us on the podcatcher of your choice. Tell us what you think of the show. It'll help people find, find us. You know, if you haven't gotten to it yet, why not? What do we do? How did we hurt you? <laughs> yeah, and you know, if you if you post a review and then send us a link and tell us that you did it or send me a message, I'll send you some stickers in the mail. How about that? Oh, very nice. You can email us uh, with comments, questions, jokes, uh, comments that you had posted about a review of our show at ircb at destroythecybe.org. That's ircb at destroythecyborg, but there's a dot before the org. Uh, you mm-hmm. can subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com slash IRCB podcast for exclusive audio and articles, early access to top of my pile posts, and now our Discord chat room. Infinity Shred is the best band in the universe. They do all the music for our show. We love them to death. Xander is a blue wizard who comes down during the cold months and doesn't leave. In fact, that happened some 20 years ago, and he hasn't left, and (laughs) we've all been graced with his presence ever since. Thanks, Xander, for editing the show. Thank you to Kara and Brian as well for being on the show this week, and thank you to the wonderful listeners out there. You guys warm my heart every week, and it it just makes me so happy that you're out there. Until next time, comics are great, and so are you.